Hi, everybody. So glad that uh, we were able to get this working and you can all hear me now. So yeah, as Ben said, my name's Chris Erickson. I'm the deputy director at CREATE, which is the Center for the Regulation of the Creative Economy at the University of Glasgow. And I was the main investigator on this uh, project, but we have several co-authors who we'll talk about in a moment. Um, and my research at the University of Glasgow is mainly focused on the relationship between uh, regulation, particularly intellectual property, and um, innovative communities, which includes uh, more and more um, communities related to research in uh, institutions like universities, as well as, um, uh, let's say, cultural heritage institutions and other memory institutions, which are inputs sometimes to culture, research, innovation, and knowledge. Um, so this project really connects with a lot of my existing interests and um, is focused on uh, the role, if any, of technological protection measures, these TPMs, these digital locks, um, previously uh, related to DRM, digital rights management, that um, perhaps uh, impede or limit or frustrate those um, activities of research preservation and innovation. So as Ben said, there are three reports which are being published imminently, report one, is uh, here on the right-hand side and um, is out now. You can download it from the link below uh, where all three reports will be um, uploaded soon. Reports two and three are coming in, the, I, I suspect, in the next week or so. So um, we're gonna cover all three actually today, um, but I'm gonna spend less time on report one because it's not my work, it's the brilliant work of um, Anthony Rossborough, who's a uh, lecturer in intellectual property law and computer science at Dalhousie University in Canada, but also spends a lot of time in Europe and understands quite deeply the European legal context. His report is brilliant and very thorough. As you'll see in a moment, I'll just give you a sneak preview of sort of what he's done, but essentially it's a comparative legal analysis of the status of TPMs in national laws uh, of the 27 member states, as well as some interesting comparator jurisdictions like New Zealand and Japan, um, as well as of course the UK. So it's um, very, very precise and um, contains lots of detail. If you're one of those sort of legal nerds who wants to go into the specific um, implementation of uh, information society directive across the European Union, this report will sort you out for that. My two reports are more quantitative social science. So the first one, or rather report two, that was written with Victoria Stobo at the University of Liverpool, is a survey of institutions and researchers about their encounters with TPMs to try to get some understanding from the ground about um, you know, what are the actual practical issues that are coming up in, in institutions, libraries, archives, um, et cetera, as well as, as well as for researchers. And then the third report, um, is about digital preservation, and it's an economic and quantitative study of the, again, the economic impacts, the real sort of social cost, if you like, social welfare costs that arise from TPMs on old legacy digital video games. Um, and it uses a, a, a methodology which um, we're quite excited to share with you uh, to try to put a measurement, an actual number on the uh, frustration or the difficulties imposed by TPMs. So let's just have a quick look at report, report one. Um, which launched um, uh, this week. So the core legal con context, I think, for all of these studies is really still the Information Society Directive Article 6, right? Which um, essentially establishes the prohibition on circumvention of technological protection measures under Article 6.1. Um, uh, when you know, the person carries out uh, uh, with the knowledge or with reasonable grounds to know that um, that they are pursuing the objective of, of circumvention. And um, also though provides for um, exceptions um, ostensibly. So in article 6.4, uh, it, 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 it uh, establishes that in the absence of voluntary measures taken by rights holders, member states shall take appropriate measures to ensure that rights holders make available to the beneficiary of an exception or limitation provided in national law, the means of benefiting from that exception or limitation to the extent necessary to benefit um, where the beneficiary has legal access. So effectively, um, 
um, right holders should should be able to make available uh, um, access to the work that um, enables the beneficiary to uh, enjoy the exception. Um, but as we'll see, the uh, the potential prospective beneficiary of an exception must make that request to the rights holder. Um, and then there are differing sort of national impl implementations about what happens next. So um, the the legal context, as Anthony very nicely outlines in his report, is that um, Europe is kind of a patchwork of different implementations, different different national implementations of the Information Society Directive Article Six, because it it allows latitude in, for example, which exceptions. Um, can uh, you know benefit from Article 6.4. In other words, not all um, exceptions um, uh, benefit from the ability to request access from rights holders. Um, and that varies from member state to member state. As we see here, um, you know, Belgium uh, uh, enables uh, many more exceptions, for example, than, than Bulgaria or Austria. So this is already quite confusing. And um, we can see that uh, uh, it really depends on which member state you are in, um, you know, the extent to which you can, you can um, you know, make a request for access for, for a material which is protected by a TPM. And the other uh, great table in Anthony's report that I just want to draw attention to is this table on page, uh, starting on page 52. And it essentially, um, really succinctly explains um, the uh, way in which national authorities, national national um, jurisdictions have uh, taken measures to ensure that rights holders shall make available, right? So um, for example, in Hungary, there is considerably strong um, uh, framework and potential enforcement. So if no agreement is reached between the beneficiary of a, of a use and a right holder of, about the conditions of making the free use possibility, um, it, it may be turned to a mediation board. So there's a mediation board that, um, for example, a library or archive would have recourse to if, they, if they're not getting the uh, desired response from a, from a right holder to gain access. Um, whereas in Ireland, there's no such um, administrative body or tribunal. It simply says that um, complainants can apply to an appropriate court. So it really varies from country to country what kinds of legal um, you know, frameworks and possibilities are available uh, in order to benefit from these exceptions. So, so I think it's a, it's a brilliant report, and I recommend that you all um, have a look. Uh, even if you're not as, as as nerdy and interested in the legal precision, because uh, he provides a great background in general about how this came to be, how, why TPMs are, enjoy such strong protection internationally, and their various kinds of um, you know uh, flavors under different different national national laws. But let's let's look at the empirical work. So, report two. This is the survey. So it's actually two uh, surveys in one. We um, performed a survey of institutions, as well as researchers who may or may not be affiliated with a, an institution. And the survey covers European um, uh, member states, plus uh, non-EU states in Europe, such as the UK. And uh, so the institutional survey was aimed at libraries and archives. In other words, research support institutions th that may hold in their collections materials that could uh, be protected by technological protection measures. So um, in terms of the breakdown of the uh, you know, uh, responses to the survey, we received 92, um, making this a fairly extensive survey as the largest one we could find um, that specifically focused on technological protection measures. So we're we're happy that we we got a good response um, across across the um, sector to to the survey. It was a Qualtrics um, online survey. Some institutions requested paper copies of the survey instrument so that they could sort of complete their answer um, internally. You know, communicating between different departments of the institution. So that really heartened us because it it showed that you know many institutions were taking this really seriously and they had lots to say, but they wanted to make sure that they got it correct. Um, uh, by speaking to their colleagues. Uh, 
So uh, we've received responses from a range of different types of institution. Um, everything from sort of small, uh, tiny specialist libraries of like one to five full-time equivalent employees, all the way up to really large institutions like national libraries um, and uh, university libraries kind of maybe finding themselves somewhere in the middle. So in addition to responses from university and national libraries, we also had some responses from public lending libraries, special collections libraries, and even specialist archives, such as archives for a um, particular economic uh, trade association or sector or archives which hold, let's say, standards or um, other kinds of materials. Uh, but the bulk of the responses were from large institutions and from uh, mainly from university libraries across across Europe. And I will say, just in terms of um, you know caveating our responses, um, this this uh, is not a purposive uh, sample that covers all twenty seven member states. It was a sort of self selected um, sample that was drawn from you know sending the survey targeting um, as many institutions across the member states as we could. But we had no control over the response rate, so we ended up receiving more responses from northern and central Europe than we did from um, southern and eastern Europe which I think won't come as a surprise to too many of you. This is kind of a, um, an issue that many folks studying the sector have encountered and remarked upon before. So there is room for a scope for improvement in terms of like widening the scope of um, uh, you know, responses from differently situated national contexts. But I think you'll see that um, the, in general, the story which emerges from the survey um, probably comports across, across Europe. So the, the first thing we wanted to achieve with this study was basically like, okay, what are the TP, where do you encounter TPMs and what are the specific types of TPMs and, and uh, blockages that you encounter? So the answer to the first question is everywhere. Almost all the media that um, libraries and archives plausibly deal with, everything from audiovisual discs, materials, computer games, old software, um, images, di digital images, of course, um, uh, now, ebooks, e journals, all are sources of, of potential um, TPM locks. Um, and in terms of what they noticed most, um, of course, there are sort of the, the, the common ones of just online um, encryption or authentication blocks, limits on downloads, like in terms of numbers or ability to download from, for example, a, a different IP range than the institution, um, limits on access, limits on copying, limits on printing. As well, within those categories, limits which which um, produce disutility for researchers. In other words, uh, maybe a researcher could access the PDF, but it would be through uh, like a um, a let's say a computer controlled terminal window, which then locks the ability maybe to copy text or to paste or to make notes or annotate or do the kinds of things like um, you know that you might need to do in order to like fully research or um, make, make best use of material. So the disutility from those TPM protected materials compared to an equivalent exact version, which doesn't have the TPM protection was noted you know, across the board for different types of, of digital materials. And then um, fewer uh, institutions reporting, but still um, you know, I think interesting are limits on interoperability and limits based on uh, geographic location, geoblocking. Uh, to a lesser extent, um, uh, limits on the ability to reverse engineer or repair, although we'll see that that sort of flips when we consider individual responses, this is institutions. So, um, you know, many, many limitations uh, practically. Then we wanted to understand how does this affect the uh, functions of these libraries uh, in terms of, you know, their public mission to promote access to knowledge, to do things like promote research, um, lending, learning and teaching. And here, the dark blue bars are the percentage of institutions that reported an impediment to that function from TPMs. The ones with the um, sort of light blue bar tips are ones where they said, no, we're not, we're not encountering uh, blocks in that particular function. So, so it's, it's quite troubling, I think, that research is most heavily impeded by um, the presence of TPMs. And I think this has to do with, um, you know, both the sample, which is largely um, consists of, you know, university libraries and research support institutions, but also the fact that although although TPMs, um, you know, 
you, you still may be able to see a work that's protected by TPMs. You won't be able to manipulate, copy, te text and data mine it, or do the kinds of research activities using that work if there are TPM locks and protections in place. And so it's, in other words, easy for a TPM to inhibit uh, research, considering that research needs more than just the ability to see uh, a digital copy of a work. But also impacted things like lending, interlibrary loan ability, um, educational uses, right? Imagine, you know, we heard from um, media studies professors and um, users of audiovisual material that they couldn't isolate a clip to show in a classroom. They couldn't, they couldn't um, access an online streaming version of a um, audiovisual material that they had lawful access to in the university setting in a way that the students could also access and maybe comment on or manipulate and use. So, um, so that was a, a frequently noted impediment. As we go down the list, um, we see it affecting TPMs affecting even on-site access for visitors, um, even community engagement, obviously the ability of the public to come in and touch and feel and manipulate and um, engage with uh, materials. Format shifting and preservation were less um, uh, frequently noted by the institutions in our sample, um, uh, but nevertheless, we're still potentially impeded by, by the presence of, of, of TPMs. Okay, so um, next we asked, you know, what do you do when you encounter a TPM to institutions? And institutions, of course, are constrained by, by the law and they're perhaps constrained more so than individuals. And we'll look at this in a bit. Um, so they, they weren't necessarily able to um, circumvent. Um, instead, they took out their frustrations in terms of their acquisition strategy. So a number of institutions said that they would avoid acquiring or using material that came with heavy TPM restrictions. They would look for alternative providers or they simply wouldn't purchase the, the content. That is factoring into their acquisition strategy. I think that's really important um, to understand. They would try to steer users to other options. They're trying to serve their your, their clientele, their user base. So they try to find solutions maybe by appointing them at alternative providers that, that weren't um, TPM locked. They um, Many did attempt to make a request to a publisher or right holder for access to a work um, where they had lawful access and they needed to benefit from an exception. So around 37, 38% of institutions reported making such a request. Some were simply um, locked out and they avoided those uses. If it weren't able to manipulate, copy, um, annotate, or uh, you know, otherwise text and data mine, they simply couldn't do it. And they gave up and said, okay, well, you know, we have to avoid those uses. So that's 30% of institutions, which is um, of course not, not optimal. Um, and, and in many of the cases, it was sort of like you know, saying to the user, well, you know, good luck to you. Please try to find it another way. We can't help you. And very, very few institutions reported actually actively seeking to circumvent the material in order to help their, their um, users, although some did say that they would, you know, try to download and make printed copies of PDFs upon request um, using the means available to them, but they didn't necessarily see that as circumvention. Um, but yeah, they were very reticent to, um, to admit to, or even indeed to undertake any kind of circumvention because they felt that that was uh, legally, legally risky uh, to do so. So um, for those institutions that did make a request to a right holder, one of our goals with this study was to try to understand what happens when you make such a request. Um, so there have been efforts in, uh, previously to try to um, put some numbers on the time delay, the wait time, the administrative costs of engaging with rights holders to request uh, access to works which are um, protected by TPMs, um, such as a LIBOR LACA study, um, I believe last year, um, which uh, had similar findings to ours, although those are ours consider, can, can, uh, considers many more institutions than were contained in that survey. So. The first thing to note is that 62% of the institutions surveyed never have engaged in such a, such a process of requesting, right? It was only 38% who reported that they would consider or that they had, had um, considered um, contacting a rights holder to request access. So already there's a sort of filter which is preventing institutions from even trying this. And we, we, we wonder and we try to investigate whether that's due to lack of legal knowledge, lack of confidence, lack of resources, 
I, we suspect it's kind of all three, right? That it's not easy to engage in this, and it's not even clear that such a route is available unless you've read Anthony Rossborough's report one. So hopefully that in itself, you know, increases uh, institutions' willingness to at least engage in this process. And then in terms of um, what happens next, well, your request might be um, simply unsuccessful. The um, the right holder might say no. We don't. We won't provide you access. Either we cannot, or we don't have the means, or we don't think that your request is reasonable, and you won't get access. Um, that frequently comes in the form of just simply not receiving any response at all from the uh, from the rights holder. So your your request just kind of ends up in the void. But when they do respond, it often takes a significant amount of time to receive a negative uh, response, um, a week or longer, over over one month of wait time. Your request may be successful as it was for 29% uh, of all institutions uh, did, survey did report making a successful request at least once in the past. Um, and the wait times are shown um, on the right hand side. So there's a you know real variation in how long it takes to hear back from a right holder. Sometimes it's uh, as soon as uh, you know 48 hours, other times it takes up to a month or even over one month. I think what's interesting is this middle um, group who said who received a response of yes you can receive access to the um work without tpms but you'll have to pay extra because this is a higher tier on the subscription model to the to the content so so yes with payment arguably sort of counts as a no because it's not really um uh achieving what the law is aiming to do if we look closely at these um sort of ones down here in the right corner um this amounts to 63% of the cases. Those are those are those 63% of institutions who made any request, or 22% of all institutions in our sample, um, had a, a wait time of a month or longer, or no response at all from rights holders when making a request uh, to uh, you know lawfully benefit from a from an exception. So this is unacceptable um, and um, you know unfortunate situation, and it, no wonder that um, you know. Not, not very many institutions in general are willing to engage with these uh, processes. So then we asked them, well, what would be an acceptable wait time uh, to you in order to receive a response from a um, uh, right holder or a government process mediation board, for example? So, um, you know, here we see, I think, a quite reasonable um, uh, you know, distribution of preferences for at least less than five working days and preferably 72 hours or less to receive a response from a right holder and, um, you know, a slightly longer forgiving time frame for a government process, but still, you know, expecting to receive a response in 10 working days or less from a government um, uh, process. <clears throat> so finally, on the institutional survey, we asked both respondent groups, institutions and individuals, to rate using a Likert style uh, you know, scale of zero to five, their level of confidence and knowledge about a variety of issues related to this problem. So um, the lower scores closer to one indicate stronger confidence and scores closer to five indicate the least confidence. Um, and so when we're thinking about um, knowledge about copyright law, almost all of the institutions were fairly positive about their general understanding of copyright law, although we see a pattern emerging whereby the smallest institutions are less confident on average than the very largest ones. Um, and as we go down the rabbit hole of legal specificity into knowledge about um, TPMs, um, knowledge concerning copyright exceptions, and then confidence in um, circumvention of TPMs or the legal and administrative processes to request removal, we find an absolutely dire situation for the smallest institutions where um, you know, they're quite uh, heavily impacted from a lack of resources and a lack of knowledge and confidence about um, being able to engage with right holders to request removal. Um, and, uh, and, and only the very large institutions um, are somewhat better in terms of their, their, their confidence and knowledge. But I think in general, what we see here is an opportunity for advocacy, education, and research um, to help um, you know, improve this unequal distribution of, of um, you know, engagement with these processes across differently situated 
uh, organizations. Okay, let's move on to the individual survey, uh, just just briefly. So, um, yeah. So rather than only capture, you know, the pers perspective of institutions, which although you know, as we've seen, they have unequal, uh, you know, resources and differing levels of risk uh, tolerance. They nonetheless are institutions, and so they have, uh, you know, presumably more uh, resources than a, than a simply an individual researcher like myself or or you all. So this survey um, again uses the same uh, geographic scope. So it's European uh, territories plus um, states which are not in the EU but are in Europe, and we see the breakdown in terms of the um, demographics of the respondents. That the majority were from EU member states. Um, and a more or less equal split between those who identified as non-university affiliated, so sort of independent researchers, maybe working for nonprofits or institutions like museums, or even just uh, businesses or um, you know just independent scholars. And then forty-six percent of the respondents are being university affiliated, so students, graduate students, professors, or university library uh, researchers. So um, looking, I think it's interesting to look at the pattern of difference between in individuals and institutions in terms of the responses to that question of where do you encounter TPMs? So the uh, dark blue bars are individuals. So we see a similar pattern between individuals and institutions when it comes to online authentication, um, uh, encryption, um, limits on downloading, limits on access, these are more or less the same. But what's fascinating here is look at limits on geographic location. So TPMs that enforce geoblocking are much more strongly felt and noted by individuals compared to institutions. And this is sort of intuitive when you think about it because individuals um, are oftentimes subjected to geoblocking more than institutions um, because maybe they're not accessing the materials from the IP range of the university, which has sort of been authenticated with the um, content provider. Um, and they may be accessing materials which are like audiovisual or other kinds of materials which they're using for research, but are perhaps being accessed through consumer channels where geoblocking is more prevalent. Um, we see a very similar pattern on copying, but then again, we see a difference when it comes to interoperability. So interoperability uh, refers to TPM's ability to stop us from being able to access uh, the same material on different electronic devices to like format shift. Um, and so in individuals, again, are reporting higher instances of being frustrated um, by TPMs in that uh, use. Um, also likely because um, you know, uh, institutions may just sort of be focused on one device, which is probably your office PC, uh, whereas in, uh, users may be accessing on mobile phone, on, um, you know, other types of terminals and devices and different software and different hardware environments where these things uh, cause frustration. And finally, a similar pattern again on the ability to reverse engineer or repair. So, so again, individual researchers are probably dealing with a wider range of electronic devices where um, you know, the ability to repair them is frustrated by TPMs. Libraries perhaps don't engage in many cycles of, of repair and restoration of electronic devices unless they're involved in electronic preservation. Another dimension of report two, um, other than asking about the response times uh, received from um, making requests to rights holders, which we did ask of both groups. We don't have time to go through every single finding from both reports, but I just want to highlight that um, another thing that we asked both groups was about having their online access suspended. So um, this is a, a type of TPM whereby, let's say you, you have access to a, an online database of e-journals and um, the TPM access might, uh, well, first of all, would involve encrypted encryption in terms of access control to the resource itself, depending on what type of user you are. And then secondly, once you've accessed the material, there could be additional TPMs, for example, which inhibit your ability to copy text off the screen or even how many, um, you're allowed to access in one session or how many pages you're allowed to, to print or download and those sorts, sorts of TPMs. And in certain cases, your access to those online um, you know, uh, systems can be suspended. In other words, you can have your account blocked and you simply won't be able to access the materials at all. So we asked individuals and institutions, have you ever had your account suspended and what was the outcome? 
So um, approximately a one quarter of the in individual responses reported that yes, they had encountered an access suspension um, to an online uh, content provider. And what's interesting then is what happens next. So in only, in less than 1% of individuals cases, uh, the provider corrected the error. In other words, the user made a request to the uh, content provider saying, actually, I, I have lawful access to do that. I'm, 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 I'm making those download requests for a lawful purpose, such as text and data mining, because I'm a researcher and um, that's covered by the exception and I should be able to uh, you know, do that. Um, so, but in only one, less than 1%, that was actually done. In the majority of cases of account suspension, it was the individual who changed their behavior. In other words, they had a pretty poor bargaining position when it came to being able to benefit from an exception in that sort of relationship where you're like a subscriber to a to a online um, provider. Um, sometimes the problem just resolved itself on its own, like the suspension was just a temporary one, um, you know, for 72 hours, and then they were restored without, you know, ever having to send a complaint. Um, but but in the in the most um, um, and then finally, in some cases, and this differs from the individual to the institutional uh, situation, individuals reported changing providers like, well, if I'm not going to be able to do what I want with the, the materials you know, that are available to me from this provider, I've got choice, I can go to a different provider. This, this graph, and well, you know, I'll leave it up to you, I won't spoil the, the result, but if you go through report two, you'll see that this, this um, Sankey diagram for the institutions looks different because institutions don't have as much choice. So they're kind of locked into providers and they don't have, and not as many of them have the ability to change providers. They're simply more at the whim of the provider's um, you know, rules. But in both cases, we see a sort of power imbalance um, between uh, the, the, the providers and the, and the users with this, um, on this issue. So again, similarly to the previous um, you know, uh, uh, table, we asked individuals their level of confidence with regard to the copyright law and then down the rabbit hole into TPMs. And generally, we see a pattern of sort of pretty good confidence about copyright, but a bit shakier as we get into these um, legal routes, which are available to you in order, for example, to request access to um, material from right holders. And in summary, for the survey report too. I think um, you know, it's clear across the, the sector of cultural heritage and institutional um, research support institutions that there's resource constraints and there's risk aversion in, in terms of dealing with TPMs. Um, and there's, not, there's no clarity in terms of the legal route to um, gaining access. As we see in Anthony's report one, it's it's hard for me to understand. I'm sure it's hard for all of you to understand the, the differing patchwork. Um, so, so it's definitely difficult for institutions to do that. So we see reduced engagement with legal processes to request access. And there are questions of equity and fairness between differently situated institutions and researchers. As soon as you start imposing resource costs and knowledge costs on successful access, then those folks who aren't able to um, reach that threshold of you know, confidence won't be able to engage. And so you've got unequal outcomes in terms of um, research access, which is really problematic. This is uh, also exacerbated by this sort of power relationship between the um, power of the uh, you know, publishers and service providers compared to users. Um, and in general, these processes which are established under the law um, of, of EU member states are slow, cumbersome, opaque, and unpredictable, which aren't good things for um, you know, a nice, efficiently run research support institution wanting to realize its mission. And in general, TPM protected materials are second best to materials which are open and free to access. And the second best status um, affects the ability to do research, which practically means manipulating, bringing together, annotating, and otherwise using materials. Um, and this has follow-on effects for innovation, research and development, spillovers into societies, not just about research um, for research's sake, right? I mean, small and medium-sized enterprises and businesses and entrepreneurs make use of you know, these knowledge inputs from memory institutions and research support institutions. And when TPM restrictions are in place, they have follow-on impacts for those uses. 
So what do we recommend as a result of those findings in report two? Well, we support the recommendation from uh, DGRTD, which was a European Commission report in 2024. Uh, to add all research-related exceptions to the list in Article 6.4. So rather than have this patchwork of different um, ex um, exceptions able to trigger um, requests or rights holders or not, let's just make um, all of them um, uh, available, such as uh, the Article 5.1 quotation and Article 5.3, which have research and education applications. Following on from Bulgaria and Slovenia, which have in their national implementations imposed a 72 hour time limit on right holders to respond to requests for access. We think that makes sense and it's worth broadening across the EU. With clear steps to be taken by the institution or the researcher if that time limit is exceeded. It shouldn't just leave them in legal limbo. They should then have a clear step uh, to be able to do. And as we'll discuss here in a moment in report three, um, we think it would be very helpful to um, research institutions and particularly preservation cultural heritage institutions to clarify that um, they may circumvent TPMs locally when uh, making use of works for preservation purposes um, as defined under Article 6 of the Copyright in the Digital Single Market Directive. So that's report two. Um, and uh, next I want to turn to report three, which deals with digital preservation specifically. So this report is um, slightly different. It doesn't deal with a um, established institutional context like a museum. It deals with an open source global initiative of um, software engineering volunteers and hackers called MAME. So MAME stands for the Multiple Arcade Machine Emulator. An emulator is a type of software which enables interoperability between an old legacy uh, format and a new um, processing environment. So in other words, if you had an emulator for an original Macintosh computer, you could run Macintosh programs on your brand new MacBook Pro or even in a Windows environment. And um, so emulators have been widely used to, um, as a strategy for preservation institutions to bring old digital artifacts and materials into the present time without worrying about the deterioration and decay of the underlying um, you know, circuit boards or magnetic storage material, which is sometimes called bit rot. And as we saw in our um, survey of institutions, many, many institutions are beginning to have to deal with electronic records, electronic files, and other sort of electronic materials. But as we know, technology continuously progresses. And so we have this real problem of ensuring long-term access to materials which are stored on electronic media. And as you all can probably see coming from a mile away, those electronic media and formats are often restricted with technological protection measures. And this photograph on the left is an example of a technological protection measure being circumvented by volunteers who worked for the MAME emulator project to try to preserve an old video game, which was made by a Spanish manufacturer in uh, Barcelona in 1993. Okay, so they burned their games software into those chips, those ROM chips, but they put a devious TPM method uh, in the central uh, processing unit to try to pr um, prevent other competitors from being able to access, modify, copy, and um, in other words, bootleg their, their game. But researchers in the 21st century, you know, 30 years after the initial um, economic exploitation of this, this was an arcade game, you know, that would have been in a truck stop bar between Barcelona and Valencia somewhere, you know, and there were only 150 of them ever made. So it's, so it's a very precise problem, but from the perspective of you know, cultural preservation, um, it could still have high value, but the ability to actually circumvent this particular idiosyncratic TPM creates an economic imbalance, as you can see, right? Because you have to expend incredible amounts of resources to decrypt this mysterious uh, chip from 1993, uh, just in order to gain access to, to the materials. That's what the MAME developers did here in this uh, white paper by Williamson and Kierkegaard. Um, you know, extremely laborious thing. So 
In other words, this is a really interesting research site to study the labor and resource costs and um, inhibitions from TPMs, even if we were able to, under the law, circumvent them. These MAME volunteers, should be noted, have little regard for copyright law. They are not an institution. They're not a professor at a university. They're just doing what they want. And, um, you know, they're, they're tolerated by the rights holders. There haven't been any significant legal, um, you know, complaints or um, disputes levied at uh, the MAME emulator. They have for other emulators, but, but MAME has so far passed under the, um, under the radar of uh, right holders. This was the content which was on the circuit board in the previous um, example, this game called Alligator Hunt by an obscure Spanish arcade developer from 1994, would have been lost forever without the hackers taking the initiative of circumventing the TPM. So if they had been a cultural heritage institution and they were just simply felt that they weren't able to extract the, the code, once the battery on that um, uh, encryption module dies, the game's code can be lost forever. And so, you know, there, we're in some uh, sense a race against time with digital objects. Now, not only video games, imagine digital records or old photographs or old documents which are stored, let's say, on magnetic tape or other kinds of, um, you know, uh, optical or, or other uh, magnetic storage, which require some old computer in order to access and, and, and use, or some software environment to access and read. Well, if TPMs are present in any of those points, then essentially we're waiting for the magnetic, um, you know, information on those tapes to deteriorate, um, after which point we won't be able to access them at all. So we need to be able to take action now to digitally save and store a whole galaxy of digital resources, not just a cheesy you know, video game, although this is the, the case example. So um, to analyze the, the uh, costs arising from TPMs, we studied the entire duration of the MAME emulation effort. It was started in 1997. Uh, by one person, it grew to a global community of hundreds of contributors that were writing code, helping to emulate and locate old games and extract the information to circumvent TPMs. And over the course of um, 20 years, you know, from uh, 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 1997, when the main project started until now, they have managed to preserve um, nearly 4,000 legacy arcade video games from the 20th century, all the way from 1972 to um, 2010, around the time when arcade games started to disappear from the market. Um, and what we've done is we essentially dug into the source code of the main project and using text and data mining ourselves, we identified from their very rigorous notes whether any of the developers encountered a technological protection measure when they were doing their um, emulation work. And yes, they did, because that was a common um, you know, uh, strategy by arcade game manufacturers throughout the late 20th century to put sort of uh, encryption TPMs and other methods of, of um, protecting their materials onto their hardware. One of the challenges for our research was that they didn't, they didn't uh, the developers of MAME didn't say, oh, I encountered a copyright um, technological protection measure. Ben, did you want to interve intervene? No, I didn't. I dropped off. So okay. um, I'm glad that the whole thing didn't crash and burn. Okay, I'll carry on. Thank you. <laughs> they used other terminology for TPMs. They, in fact, they very rarely use the word copyright, as we see in orange. Uh, other times, they use very highly specific technological terminology for the different TPMs. So we had to interview core members of the MAME team to, say, to find out from them, well, what is the language that you would have used if you encountered a TPM? Well, oftentimes, it was things like security. When they say security in their, in their notes, they're referring to an to a, uh, encryption security, which is essentially a TPM. Same thing with protection. Um, and then we even get into specific chip types, such as the FD1094, which was a prolifically used 
in, uh, encryption TPM that was used by Sega on many of their um, arcade releases in the in the late 80s. So we tried to gather as wide of a, a um, picture as possible of the different ways that the developers would have described TPMs so that we can identify which circuit boards had TPMs on them when they were doing the preservation work. And then looking at the um, progress of emulation in the source code of MAME, we then tried to figure out, okay, well, what, how did they eventually gain, did they gain access at all? And if they did, how did they do so? So in other words, did they, did they circumvent the TPMs and what kind of method of circumvention did they use? So there are different, again, different languages for how they describe the circumvention process, but some of these things are um, simulation. So they could sort of simulate what was happening inside the encrypted module without necessarily fully understanding it. Um, they could hack just by like routing some wires around the module and still get at the necessary game code in order to um, preserve it. Or they could um, dump the protection, which means fully getting inside of the protected module to see how it works, replicate the binary code, including the encryption, and then emulate that within the overall environment of the game so that's perfectly restored and preserved, even included the, the original copyright protection. And the third and uh, most astonishing to me uh, method that they used was physically decapping, that is melting the top off of the integrated circuit from an arcade circuit board, and then maybe looking at it through a microscope to try to see the ones and zeros on the actual um, you know, um, uh, chip in order to re re recreate and reproduce the functionality of the encrypted module. This is incredibly laborious and um, very clever sort of hacking um, that sometimes had to be undertaken in order to preserve these um, you know, cultural objects at all. So, so yeah, these are essentially the methods um, we used, as I've already uh, described. It involved essentially machine learning, text and data mining of the source code of the main project, which was a chosen as the as this case study field site because of those very detailed judicious notes that the uh, developers uh, made while they were going through the process. This study wouldn't have been possible in other media, which didn't benefit, let's say, from a very enthusiastic global hacker community that take very good notes, right? So it's, it's kind of a study of convenience. But what I'm hoping is that it is simply both a methodological template to inspire others to do similar work, to really dig into the economics and the labor costs involved in this um, you know, TPM and preservation sort of dilemma. And then also just to draw attention through the video game example to other non-game, but still copyright protected digital uh, materials of which I'm sure many of you in the community and the audience have um, to mind. So uh, we used an econometric um, analysis method, which essentially we, we conducted regression analysis on the uh, dependent variable, which is the years of delay. That is taking two games, right? Two, two um, electronic games, one which has technological protection measures on it and one which does, doesn't. And then looking, okay, how long did it take for the MAME emulating um, you know, community to fully preserve both of those games? If there was a delay of additional time required to preserve the game that had um, TPMs on it, then we're interested in identifying how much, how long that delay was. So that's why we use the dependent variable years diff. This is the difference of years between the original release of a game. Let's say it came out in 1978. I believe the very first technological protection measure that we we discovered in the report. Uh, was from 1978, uh, the very first, the very first TPM, uh, and then it wasn't preserved until 2010, right? Well, then the uh, delay, the years diff is 32 years, right, from 1978 to 2010. Um, so that's the that's the uh, dependent variable. That's essentially what you're seeing when I show you the regression tables. And then we have sort of the other the variables of interest. So TPM recovery is the variable which captures whether they had to, to recover the TPMs, in other words, to circumvent in order to successfully preserve. Some TPMs could be just trivially circumvented, maybe because they, um, they were so old that, and the progress of technology made it that circumvention wasn't even necessary. Um, but for those ones that were necessary, that's captured by the variable TPM underscore recovery. 
Then we have a variety of control variables. And so this is, these are here to try to really isolate the effects of TPMs on the extension of years diff, in other words, the delay, rather than other potentially confounding variables or other, other issues. So we try to control for just the general passage of time, which, which um, is reflected in the age of games, because we, we presume that older games, maybe from the 1970s, are easier to circumvent because they are, you know, have less, um, you know, encryption uh, technology embedded in that. But we also control for things like complexity. So the size of the game, is it large in terms of file size or small? Um, we control for other difficulties that the main developers encountered while they were working on the game. So we took note in the development notes if they encountered problems simply with uh, emulating the graphics or the sound, um, which also are difficult in addition to TPMs. So sort of just to try to get a sense of the overall difficulty on that particular preservation project. And then we control for things if it came from a large manufacturer versus a small unknown manufacturer and other, other, other things such as genre of the game, um, just sort of general, general non-specific controls. So let's look at the, um, the results. So this is a regression table showing the effects on uh, years diff in different model specifications, different columns. So in each of the columns, um, what you're seeing is we're adding more and more controls to the model to see if the main variable, which is TPM recovery, remains stable as we add the, the other controls. Because if it wasn't stable, that would suggest that one of the control variables that we've added is actually maybe having quite an important um, effect that we need to investigate further. But as we see, the TPM recovery um, variable is stable across all of the different model specifications um, with a fairly uh, strong um, R squared and uh, high significance. So this is, a, this is a great result, but in some ways it's intuitive, right? Because we saw the picture of them having to attach all those wires to the circuit. We know that it's laborious, right? But essentially it's sort of how laborious are we talking, right? What is the actual delay? So what the, this, this um, variable can, can be, the coefficient can be interpreted simply as a decimal expression of years. So in other words, with all controls in place in the model, we're talking about a total delay of 0 0.882 years per game that had TPMs that required circumvention. Okay, so in other words, 10.4 months of additional time delay when circumvention was required. And, um, you know, we can aggregate that across all of the games because there were many, right? I think they, 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 they emulated almost 4,000 uh, legacy games from the 20th century. So we're talking about an aggregate social cost of 682 years or some, some number similar to that. So, so what does that number really encapsulate? I mean, on one hand, it encapsulates um, the labor time, but, you know, it's hard to... The, the main volunteers didn't spend every waking moment working on the games, right? Um, they would go to sleep, they would think, their brains would say, oh, how do I get around that encryption? You know, what, what methods can I use? So they'd have to kind of like puzzle away at the problem. Um, so the part of that is labor, but part of that time is also just missing use, missing availability to society. Because if we imagine that these games have some value, some social value to users, to researchers, to innovation spillovers to students that want to learn about game design from obscure Spanish arcade companies from the 1980s, they might be out there. They wouldn't be able to, 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 to use those preserved copies unless the TPM had been actually uh, overcome. And so that missing use is essentially also encapsulated in those months, because those are months of simply unavailability of those TPM protected uh, works. And we should specify as well, it's, it's unfortunate, but there still remain hundreds of games in the main sort of to-do list, which remain unpreserved because of TPMs. And so there's some works which inevitably will be lost forever because um, of the simply the, the unavailability of the impossibility of modern preservationists to overcome the, the TPMs. This is just to show that the, um, the effort of circumvention that's been going since 1997 to 2023 um, is, uh, it's dynamically changing over time. 
this is a statistical issue, which we sometimes call heteroscedasticity. <laughs> ben made me footnote that in the, in the report. But basically, it's simply a, a statistical feature which we need to understand about the data set. And it's a, it's a statistical feature, I think, which arises from the fact that in the early 90s, the main preservationists were kind of doing the low-hanging fruit, the easy-to-emulate games. But now in the 2020s, um, the only ones that remain are the ones which are really difficult nuts to crack. And so the variance in terms of years diff, the, the amount of time from birth to final preservation, is widening because some of those very old games are still persistently hard to fully preserve. And so that's why we're seeing the widening of the um, variance. Um, this final regression model is just to say that we've investigated kind of different um, ways of slicing the data. And so one interesting way we thought to slice the data was to consider, okay, do, does it matter, does, is the year's diff changing between the early period of MAME versus the later period of MAME? Like, have the developers gotten better, let's say, at preserving and circumventing so that maybe the problem is getting less? But in fact, what we see, as you see in the growth of the coefficient, the problem is getting worse. The year's diff is expanding and running away from us as those really old but still um, protected uh, you know, works are um, becoming in inaccessible. And so it's not, a, it's not a problem which is lessening, it's a problem which is worsening. So just to nearly conclude, um, legacy TPMs are haunting preservation and producing all kinds of other negative externalities like this missing use, the inability to work with and manipulate and uh, benefit from um, you know, access to these old materials. The requirement to seek um, access from rights holders illustrates, I think, a new problem, which I'm calling orphan TPMs. So imagine that you make a request to a rights holder, Capcom, hey, can I have access to um, your, your, your game software because I, I have um, you know, um, uh, visual impairment and I, and I you know, uh, want to make lawful use of the, of the material? Well, if the software or video game company or, or electronic you know, um, media producer used third-party TPMs or even made use of a chip set that was made in the early 2000s, but is no longer manufactured, then you have on your hands an orphan TPM because it's not within the gift or the ability of the right holder, of the intellectual property right holder to give you access because they can't even access the, the material. So um, luckily hackers and volunteers have managed to preserve and um, essentially solve this problem on their own outside of the um, uh, you know, legal framework. But there remains a question, well, can, uh, you know, cultural heritage institution or research, research institution use emulators like MAME to provide access to their, to their users? Um, I think the answer is yes, um, but it requires sort of like interpreting the law in a, in a particular way. And, and this problem, of course, as we've said, you know, uh, extends to potentially billions of electronic records and, and materials, not only video games. So to close um, and to leave uh, time for questions and comments, I'd love to hear from the community about, about this work and your suggestions. Um, our major focus is that um, Article 6 of the uh, CDSMD provides for this really strong mandatory exception for preservation that enables cultural heritage institutions to reproduce works permanently in their collections for preservation purposes, for example, to address technological obsolescence, which is exactly what we've just been talking about, um, in any format or medium, in the required number, at any point. However, the Article 6 CDSMD doesn't mention TPMs, which is, which is a frustrating oversight. So our recommendation in the report is that EU policy should just clarify that CDSMD Article 6 enables local circumvention of TPMs for preservation purposes. That seems logical um, and would enable um, you know, them to make more use of tools like MAME and the other you know, surrounding volunteer uh, tools which are available to aid preservation to really enhance their um, offering to society and to their users. Because at the moment, these hackers in MAME are, are way ahead 
of, of cultural institutions in Europe. And that just doesn't make sense, right? The, the horse is already bolted from the barn. The games are preserved thanks to the incredible work of these volunteers. And so it only makes sense to enable cultural heritage institutions to make the full use of these tools which are available. So I will stop there and uh, look forward to questions and, and comments. Okay, thank you very much, Chris. Um, just because of the technical problems that we've had today, I am not gonna switch my um, video on, which seems to be, uh, I think, one of the the issues causing the what we've seen today. So, um, could I just encourage everybody to put questions either in the chat or in the Q and A, um, and uh, if you put questions in earlier on, please repost them because. I um, when I was my computer crashed, I you 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 actually lose the the chat, so I don't actually have any um, any questions that I can see in the, in the chat. I can see one's gone into the Q and A. Um, I guess I just wanted to take a bit of a a step back in a couple of different directions. Um, so, I mean. The, the study that you've undertaken, Chris, has been absolutely great um, in, 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 in quite a significant amount of more depth than that undertaken by UK Lacquer and Lieber a number of years ago. Um, but some of the statistics, I, I'm wanting to say that survey was probably done about three or four years ago now. Um, you know, some of the statistics are exactly the same. And and I suppose the one that that springs out is the fact that in twenty in twenty percent of the cases, um, problems were not resolved in over a month. And as you as you showed, um, that could be because they they were never solved, or because in 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 the minority of cases they were finally solved, um, but it took over a month. And I I think it's interesting, particularly for the librarians that are with us today, to sort of mull over the response to that. We 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 try to ask about libraries requesting refunds for lack of access for material um, that that had been paid for at significant cost, but for which there was no access given within um, a you know a, a reasonable period of time. And I suppose I contrast that constantly with us as consumers. Um, if your Amazon Prime account doesn't work, Amazon will sort it out within hours and they will offer compensation for the inconvenience that they've caused. So it was quite interesting, I think, that 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 this doesn't didn't didn't seem to really we didn't really kind of get much of an answer back from from the librarians that filled in the survey um and and again i think perhaps that is 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 um perhaps that reflects the imbalance of power that we see repeatedly see in this area between the publishers who have a monopoly control over the data and, and the content they access in the institution that must access that information in order to in order to function. Um, so I can, I, that, can I comment uh, on that on that? Sure, yeah. Yeah, so I think what Ben Ben's highlighting, Ben Ben saw inside of this process because he was involved as a reviewer and helped with the design of the survey instrument. Um, which, by the way, you'll be able to see when you when you download report two. We've included it in the appendix, so you can see what we've done. Um, but yeah, we asked about re refunds, didn't we, um, to both the institutions and individual researchers? Like, um, you know, is that one of the recourses that you you have? And I th I think if I recall, zero of the institutions indicated, or some very small percent indicated that they had sought a refund. It wasn't something that was in their vocabulary. They didn't feel empowered to be able to to do that um, with regard to purchase materials. They would change their future acquisition strategy and purchasing behavior if they could, if there was room to maneuver. Um, but other times they very felt much felt sort of at the mercy of the specific provider for the uh, materials which they needed to access in order to fulfill their mission. So refunds were not really were not really on the table. I just want to highlight one other thing. 
which is in, um, we had many free form answers where um, respondents were able to expound on their um, issues. And I think several institutions lamented the fact that publicly available, publicly funded research and innovation inputs were protected behind um, TPM blocks. And one of the biggest examples, which I found interesting, was an institution or, and researcher that uh, needed access to technical standards like ISO standards and other documents, which were digital documents. But these were government standards. And the government had set an industrial standard. There's a library or archive which has all the standards. And you as a user aren't allowed to access the standards behind, because they're behind um, uh, a TPM protection. So that was uh, frustrating. Um, and, and seemingly, you know, counterintuitive, given that it was the government that wanted to propagate the standard. Um, I, I suppose, again, for the those uh, institutional representatives on the call, I we we had a a, a period with one of the four large publishers where at the British Library we w did not have access to material that we'd paid for for a significant period of time in the reading rooms. And we requested uh, a refund and we didn't get a refund, but we did get um, the nearest thing, which was sort of essentially tokens. So essentially, if we resubscribed, we would get a sort of a, a X, the same period for free. So it is definitely um, worth, I think, institutions when they are uh blocked out for for significant periods um approaching publishers for and, and and discussing refunds um i guess the other thing that i wanted to uh highlight is we've you know perhaps it's stockholm syndrome but we we mustn't forget that um you know the role of the legislature and the legislature created over 300 years a long raft of permitted acts, user rights, activities which are entirely lawful. And as we moved into the digital environment, the legislature sort of kicked back, put its feet up and decided to allow um, rights holders to decide uh, whether, um, you know, the permitted acts, the exceptions were were enjoyable either via contract or because they were they were being blocked by technical protection measures so we've seen a you know we've seen a marked shift from regulation by the state to support important activities like scientific research and education and learning um and they have really since 1994 and the advent of the the the, the digital environment left it to rights holders to 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 determine whether access is permissible and on on what terms so we have seen this marked shift marked shift in the so-called balance that copyright law is supposed to to create um and i guess we you, i mean you didn't really focus specifically on um scientific research or ebooks or e-journals um report three is about video games but unless we find policy solutions to allow circumvention of technical protection measures speedily which is best practice or um we we we, we regulate to ensure that contracts cannot override exceptions we risk material that otherwise would have entered in, into the public domain never entering the public domain. One of our funder, Peter Baldwin from the Arcadia Foundation, is very eloquent on the issue of ebooks. You know, he questions with ebooks whether there will be a public domain for ebooks in 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 the future, given that they're governed by license and they're protected by technical protection measures. So these issues that Chris has raised today, I think, have have long term significance, which policy makers uh, really need to, to to grapple with. And I think, you know, those of us that are interested in these issues similarly need to highlight them wherever and whenever uh, we, we possibly can.
I just wanted to do to make one small clarification, which was about Slovenia and Bulgaria. Um, so both those laws require, in the case of text and data mining only, um, that access is given within 72 hours. So uh, I think this this stands as a good kind of benchmark and, sh and should be the norm essentially across the board for all lawful activities. Ben, um, Ka Ka Katerini Kameridou asked in the chat a, a question extending on that about B Bulgaria and Slovenia, which I think is very interesting, and you and I have talked about this. What should be the next step available to, um, to researchers and other beneficiaries of an exception if the 72-hour time limit is exceeded? I mean, I, I would say um, it should be a two-pronged response. One, one, if the individual or institution has the ability to circumvent, that should be lawful. Um, but, but there should be some quick-fire response from the government to ensure that the rights holders, where they still exist, must respond quickly. So, so I think I don't I don't think it's an either or. I think. Um, if it was, we're making a big assumption that everyone has the technical wherewithal to actually undertake circumvention, which is certainly not the case. So, so, um, and and actually, certainly the Slovenian law, which I'm most familiar with, it's a bit unclear what next steps are. I think, and you know, we mentioned this in the report, and we didn't have enough time to go through everything. But you know, one of the sort of more general recommendations that Victoria and I make is that having a more harmonized and standardized framework for processing those requests, those access requests, would be a way to both transparently monitor the time taken and the usage. And it would also be a way to kind of then track and enforce better and provide legal certainty to the claimant, uh, which, you know, as we saw with sort of orphan works, the regulation is so important because uh, institutions won't, won't, won't take the risk and digitize if, if they feel like there could be a eventual emerging rights holder or some change to the legal certainty. So there has to be a framework which is uh, standardized across Europe and provides the legal certainty for users to be able to act with confidence, because that's the only way to sort of um, ensure the maximal uptake and benefit of this open knowledge um, orientation. Um, Chris, can I, can I ask you a question? Um which was what what was or what were the most surprising things that emerged from the studies that you oversaw? Um, I'm very proud of this table. You know, this was something that we we um, you know felt it was important to have these Likert style questions to gauge sort of institutional readiness and cultural sort of uptake of legal routes to access. And so, you know, um, including the Likert style questions in the survey, I think was, 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 a, was, a, was a good methodological choice because it gives us some insight. And then, um, you know, being able to visualize kind of the, the spectrum of loss of confidence as you go from just general copyright into the um, circumvention and, and access re requests, um, I think is, is um, was gratifying to me to be able to show this evidence to the public and say, look, there's a there's an issue here. And also then, of course, from top to bottom, the the differing um, you know experiences in uh, different situated institutional types and sizes, which I think is um, is uh, useful um, for us to think about because we often don't think about these regulatory dilemmas in terms of uh, fine grained differences between. Uh, users, we tend to think of it as one size fits all, but it's not a one size fits all problem. So we need to be attentive to, um, in our advocacy and in, um, you know, uh, suggesting legal reforms to these, um, you know, uh, differences in, in size and shape. And then of course, on the video game study, um, you know, for me, the whole thing was exciting. I, <laughs> one thing I didn't get to show was like, um, if you're a real nerd like me, you know what happened in 1983, 84, 
which is that this was the great video game crash in America. And uh, there was oversupply of home cartridges. This was the year that Atari buried all those ET video game cartridges in the desert in California because uh, it just had too many you know, for, for supermarkets. And basically, we see in our data a dip in the publishing of arcade video games from 1984 to 1985. And when I saw that little dip, that uh, warmed my heart because I knew that we had we had you know really captured at least in terms of you know Mames sample of of um, emulated video games almost you know a, a representative sample of the entire you know uh, history of, of video games so that was uh, that's nerdy little detail that I I liked. Um, there's there's one question in the Q and A um, for you, Chris, from Bart Magnus. It's probably debatable whether it's a TPM or just an impeding business model, but was the issue of temporary access to digital material by publishers and platforms instead of the ability to buy and preserve a digital publication a topic covered in these studies? Yes, absolutely. And um, so it would have been it would have been um, here just covered under the third thing limits on access. Um, time-based limits on access uh, were included under that uh, that category, and, and they were noted by um, by respondents in their free form answers as well. Um, yes, but I and I would say that the ge geographic location as well as time were both uh, were both were both noted. And one more thing I want to say about this because we're kind of getting out in the extended definition of TPMs. I think Anthony does a terrific job in report one. Of, of really defining TPMs and, and helping us to understand that there's no logical reason why we shouldn't also consider these online access and um, use restrictions to be TPMs. Um, things like, like, like geoblocking, things like te te temporary um, you know, or time bound limits on access or limits on what we could do inside the browser. Um, you know, are, essentially we're talking about the same thing. We're still talking about TPMs and it's important because as you said, Ben, you know, as we move toward this digital online world, there's a shift away from sort of copyright exceptions towards controlling everything by license. Um, and that's really shaping institutional behavior and constraining institutions. Um, uh, and, and that's a feature of these sort of online, service-based, cloud-based, as-a-service type arrangements that we now have with the, the, the materials. Okay, so uh, we've, we're sort of hitting the allotted time. Um, so again, just to repeat what we said at the beginning of the session, um, we have published the first of three reports, and in the next couple of weeks, we will we will be publishing the further two reports. Um, as Chris explained, report one, which is available on the Knowledge Rights 21 website, is a legal study of European regimes and extra European regimes. And study two is the survey, which Chris presented. And study three is the uh, fascinating video game um, empirical study. Um, so yeah. So thank you very much, everyone. If you have any further questions, please either reach out to us at Knowledge Rights 21 or also to the authors, of course, um, who will be able to answer uh, everything um, in detail, I'm sure. So I, with no further ado, I shall stop recording. And um, for those of you that, that it's morning, um, have a very good day.